Well, good morning, everyone, and welcome. Uh, thanks for being here today on, on this Saturday morning. Uh, hope you and your loved ones are healthy and safe and are doing well. I'm not sure where the weather is where you are, but it suddenly feels very much like fall here uh, in Newton, Massachusetts. Um, my name is Pete Caruso, and I'm an Associate Director of Undergraduate Admission here at Boston College. And I want to welcome you to the first Coffee and Conversations with Boston College faculty. This is the first of, of five sessions that we will be featuring uh, over the next several Saturday mornings at this time with uh, a number of members uh, of our faculty. And it is part of a month long uh, virtual open house that our office kicked off uh, earlier this week um, that will contain uh, numerous programs featuring, of course, our Boston College faculty, students, and various aspects of the admissions process, including one this afternoon on how admission decisions are made and uh, hope you're able to continue to participate in those programs over the next several weeks. Um, in addition, we have also been holding virtual uh, daily information sessions with a panel of Boston College students, which we typically do on campus. Um, we've been following that by a live virtual campus tour, taking advantage of this beautiful fall weather, uh, trying to replicate the, the deep dive about the institution when we welcome our students on campus. And you can also sign up for our one-on-one -on -one conversations with a Boston College student as part of our um, Eagle for a discussion program. And uh, my colleagues and I have started visiting high schools virtually for information sessions and we'll be continuing to do that over the next uh, several weeks. But I'm delighted to welcome uh, two members of our Boston College faculty um, who are taking time out of their Saturday to join us this morning. Uh, Dr. Juliet Shore, who is a professor uh, in our sociology department and Prasanan Papasarathi, who is a professor in our department of history. So great to have you both. Uh, I'm also joined by my colleague, Mary Beth Chevry, who's off screen right now, uh, but she's gonna be managing the Q&A uh, for the webinar. Um, you'll notice that we have disabled the chat function uh, for the webinar, but you're welcome to type any questions that you have, especially related to uh, the session this morning uh, in the Q&A session. So when we were developing um, these, the possibilities for these presentations, today we thought instead of focusing on a presentation from their respective departments that sort of focuses on the nuts and bolts, um, we wanted to spend time hearing from our professors about their stories, uh, their reflections about their relationship with students, uh, their areas of emphasis and their research as well as your questions. So just to get started, uh, again, so delighted to have our, our participants with us. Um, what brought you to Boston College and what do you love most about working uh, with Boston College students? And, and, and uh, Dr. Shura, I, I think we'll start with you first. So uh, thanks, Pete. That's, that's a great question. Um, so I was teaching at Harvard. Uh, I was there for almost 20 years. And in about the last five years of being there, two things were going on. One was I was sort of transitioning out of economics, which was the discipline I had uh, gone to school in and had been teaching in, and into sociology. And the second thing was that I uh, I was running a program, an undergraduate program, and we didn't have graduate students, so I needed to find teaching assistance from other places. And I began hiring grad students from Boston College, and they were amazing. Um, and they would get recommendations, you know, evaluations uh, from the Harvard undergrads, which said best teacher I've ever had, and you know, best teacher. And I just love that. I, you know, there was just something very nice about it. So that provided um, an entree for me into the Boston College Sociology Department. And the more I learned about it, the more interested I got. And as it happened, my husband, who you'll hear from in a minute, uh, was was. Um, uh, got a job at Boston College during this time. And so that's really uh, sort of how I, how I ended up uh, transitioning over to Boston College. Preston, you I might still, as well just go. Uh, okay. Yeah. Um, so Pete left out one important fact about us. We're married to each other. <laughs> um, and we also teach together occasionally, and we'll say a little bit about some of the teaching that we do together, I think, in a few minutes. Um, in 1997, 
we uh, moved with our two kids to Newton, Massachusetts, the Newton Center, about a mile from the BC campus. And at that time, I was uh, teaching at Harvard, and I, uh, but I was looking for a job in Indian history. I was teaching in a program, an interdisciplinary program at Harvard, and I, that was a temporary position. I was looking for a permanent position teaching Indian history. And we had heard that there might be a position at BC uh, in Indian history. And lo and behold, the, a position was advertised soon after we moved here. I applied, I got the job, and I had, was living in a house already one mile from the campus. So there's a lot of serendipity in life. This is one of the things that I've learned in, in my life. And I got to BC. Um, I loved the students. I loved the colleagues. I'll say more about all of that. And I, I've been approached a number of times in the, in the last 10, 15 years by other universities asking, are you interested? It would be great to have you. But I really, I, I really like it at BC and I couldn't imagine being anywhere else at, right now. So it's, I've been really lucky. So describe, if each of you could, could talk about a, a specific course that you teach. I know you teach together, so you might want to sort of talk about that. You know, what's, what's the syllabus like? You know, uh, you know, how particularly with that collaborative effort that you've had, you know, what has your teaching style been like? Or maybe has, has it evolved in that sense? So uh, I'm not sure how we got the idea to do this, but I mean, it's probably close to 10 years ago now, we decided that we wanted to teach a course together. And at that point, there really wasn't a, an institutionalized structure for it. But one of the nice things about BC is although it's a pretty good sized university, there's also a real, it, it's not at all bureaucratic. There's a kind of small uh, cultural feel to it and you can sort of do things like that. And so we each went to our chairs and said, we wanna, do this and we were just able to do it without any uh, hassle or you know having to go through committees or whatever and we so we started uh, it, teaching a course it was called people and nature the history and future of human impacts on the planet and it had a sociological component and a history component and um, it became I was then uh, invited to be on the committee that designed what we call the renewed core curriculum. So we have a lot of fantastic courses that are new courses that are part of this, which have innovative pedagogy and sort of some other core uh, aspects to them. And um, as part of that committee, that course that we had been teaching became kind of the the germ of an idea which developed into what are called the complex problems courses. And these are team taught interdisciplinary courses. And so we, that were along the lines of what we did. Now there's, there's much more to them at this point. Uh, they are double credit courses. So there's six credits, six hours of classes a week. Um, and they have uh, some uh, interesting dimensions to them. There's a lab section, which is project-based learning. Uh, they have a reflection sessions once a week in the evening, as well as the traditional Monday, Wednesday, Friday, 50 minute. And so we segued our course, uh, People in Nature, over to become a complex problems course. And uh, it's called Planet in Peril, uh, the history and future uh, of human impacts on the planet. Um, and that's been a really phenomenal teaching experience for us. And I'll let Prasanand say a little bit more about it, but we are teaching it now, I think, for the fourth time. Um, the first time it's wholly online, and we can say, he'll say a little bit more about that. But um, it, it's, it, it's a first year course. We get students from all across the university, and I think we would both say, uh, you know, we've been teaching for a long time. It's been the best teaching experience we've ever had. I'd like to second that. It's it's really been the most exciting and rewarding teaching that I've done. And this is a, after a, a, a three decades of teaching. <laughs> so it's it's really it's really fun, a fun course. It's very intensive because we're with the students a lot of hours every week. Um, but even though it's, it's a fairly large class, it's about 75 
students um, because we spend so much time in class with them, we, we, get, we get to know a lot of them quite well. And we also have this innovation where at the beginning of the semester, we ask each student to write a bio sketch for them to introduce themselves to us. So immediately, even though it's a large class, we get to know a lot about the students. Now, several years ago, um, BC was joined an online consortium, a consortium of universities to offer online courses. So we were asked if we would be interested in offering our course online. So, and we said, sure. So all of our lectures were taped professionally. We went down to Washington to work with this uh, online uh, teaching firm and they taped our lectures and we never ended up offering that course online, but when we taught our course, first people in uh, nature and now planet in peril, we thought, well, let's use these lectures. Instead of lecturing, using class time to lecture to the students, now the students watch the videotapes of our lectures outside class. And then class time is spent really doing a lot of uh, engaging with the material in various ways. We have group work, we have role playing games, we have discussions, uh, we have students answering, uh, work, doing worksheets that really forces them to grapple with the material. So it's really a, a much more engaged class time than students just sitting there and listening as, and taking notes as we kind of drone on. So it, the class, that makes the class really different and exciting as well. Just as a follow-up so to that. Yeah, can I just say one thing yeah, about sure. that? Okay, so that just a fun fact about the, <laughs> the professional lectures. We had, um, I got a lot more makeup assistance than uh, Prasanna did for those, but our, the person who did our makeup was the woman who did makeup for the TV series House of Cards, and we got oh, a lot of good God. gossip about <laughs> Kevin Spacey and Robin Wright. Oh my Wright. goodness, yeah. <laughs> wow, wow. That's anyway, great. sorry for interrupting No, I, I just wanted to follow up, especially in terms of, of with the, 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 the core renewal classes and you know, how they evolved you know, over the years. I, I remember just the class 2019 was the first class, you know, in, in that pilot. But, and I always wondered in terms of, particularly for first year students, how do you think they adjusted, especially because they were probably coming from a very different um, high school structure in terms of how they were taught? And did, you know, was there a transition involved for the first several weeks, especially for those first couple of years? Well, I think it depends. So there are two parts to the renewed core. One is these complex problems classes mm -hmm. that we've been talking about. The other are what are called enduring questions. And those are smaller classes. They're 19 person classes. And you, it also involves six credits, but you take two uh, linked classes. So each one has one professor. All the students in both classes are the same students and they occasionally meet together. Mm -hmm. um, and they try and um, their syllabuses sync up a little bit. But um, so those, I think, are a little bit more like high school because they're more, uh, they're smaller, they're more discussion based, etc. The complex problems are really the first time that students are going to be in a big lecture, uh, which is something that happens in the transition to college. And what we there's something really interesting that we found when we flipped our classrooms, which is that uh, the first time we did it, we had a mixed class of uh, first years all the way through seniors. The first years loved the flipped classroom. They loved watching the lectures outside. They're, the lectures are short videos. They're not like sit and listen to a 50 minute lecture. They're sort mm -hmm. of eight to 15 minutes uh, max. And uh, you can do them while you're working out in the gym or, you know, walking somewhere. It, they're very convenient. And you can also stop when you don't understand something and go back and listen to it again. It's one of the big benefits. Um, the seniors didn't like it that much. They'd already been socialized into what we might think of as more passive learning, which is they just go to class and sit there and, you know, they may take notes. But um, so we think that it this kind of uh, set up is actually, it makes it easier to adjust to college because in high school, you don't have lectures for the most, you have some, but it's, high school tends to be more interactive 
-hmm. smaller, smaller classes and so forth. So there's that. I mean, I think the other really big thing about these classes is that you're immediately thrown together with a group of people, whether it's 19 people or, you know, 75 people, um, who you have a lot of social interaction with. And we find that it, it sort of, you develop a little bit like a family over that mm -hmm. semester. Mm -hmm. And so it just makes it a lot easier for people to transition into the, the new social aspects of college. And, and that was one of our aims uh, when we designed these courses was to have kind of really immersive experiences for students that were very intellectual uh, but also had a social dimension and really got people engaged in the learning that they were doing as soon as they hit campus. Let me add a couple, just two things to that. I mean, one is on the flipped classroom. And at the beginning, when we first offered it as a flipped class, I was actually surprised at the number of students who in high school had experience with flipped classroom or flipped teaching, and it was more in the sciences. Mm -hmm. So there they would were accustomed to listening to some lectures on topics outside class, and then in class working through the material in some way. So I think in the sciences, it, it's, it's become more popular than say in the humanities or social sciences mm -hmm. at the high school level. Um, the other thing about the social dimensions is, because it, it's, a bunch of first first year students who are really interested in the topic. So immediately there's something that they all share. Um, and because it is so intensive and we do a lot of group work, we do, we have this thing called an eating challenge where we form the students into teams and they try to eat more sustainably for a couple of weeks. And then the winning team at, at the end of the contest, we had a big vegan ice cream party and things like that. <laughs> So the students really, I think, develop really important bonds right from the beginning of college with other students in the class. And there are students who are still from that we've had who are still hanging out with students that they met first semester freshman year in our class and friends with and close friends with that were formed then. So it's I think it's a great form of first year class teaching. Yeah, and just one other thing sure. about the the core is that. A big part of it is taking this sort of more academic or intellectual parts of it and applying them to your own life. So we're not just teaching you material. The, those reflection sessions, which happen across the, the core, uh, the renewed core, are uh, times for kind of reflecting back on the material and thinking, like, what, how, how is this relevant for me? How am I going to live my life. Um, so that's where, you know, we have ethical eating and, you know, as you know, the, the Jesuit uh, dimensions of Boston College really uh, encourage people to reflect on what the material they're learning in class means for their own lives and mm -hmm. how they live their lives. So one of my questions, but you're, you've sort of touched upon it, but I'll just give you a chance to, if, if you want to add anything, because it seems as though with these classes, it's really allowed you to, to build, I think, meaningful relationships, you know, with undergraduates. But are there any other examples that you want to give? So I also teach small undergraduate, a small undergraduate class. Mm -hmm. I teach a class of uh, important readings in sociology, which will have anywhere from eight to 10 students. So you get to know them. But uh, one of the main ways that I've engaged with undergraduates is through the Undergraduate Research Fellowship Program. And so every semester, I have at least one. This semester, I have two undergraduates who are working on my research with me. The university pays their, uh, you know, gives them, um, uh, you know, pays them a wage for their hours. So it's a job, um, but it's, it's a research job. And I have, since I came to BC, I mean, that's 20 years now, I've almost always had at least one. Um, I have written papers with these students. Uh, for about 10 years, I ran a big research team on the, what's called the gig economy. My uh, book on that just came out uh, 
about two weeks ago. It's called After the Gig. But we had undergraduates involved uh, from the beginning and on all at all facets of this. Uh, we even at some point had them doing interviewing and coding of data. Um, so we really um, involve undergraduates uh, to the maximal extent that they can, um, you know, that they're interested and can do. I'll, I'll give you one example of my current uh, research assistant who's a fantastic student. Uh, she is a rising, well, she's now a senior, and <laughs> over the summer, over the summer, she applied to a brand new program at Harvard Law School, extremely difficult to get in. They just take a few people. You apply in the summer of your junior year, and it, it guarantees you admission to Harvard Law School two years later. So you can go off and do whatever you want and not have to worry about it. And in her interview, uh, we she's been working for me all summer, uh, doing work on uh, regulations on Airbnb. It's one of the things I've been studying. Um, cities have been putting in regulations, and she uh, developed a data. We, you know, with us, she developed a database of this, and that came up in her Harvard interview. And they said because it's very relevant to law, obviously, and they, that apparently was one of the things that got her in. So. It's a great program. It's wonderful. Historians don't usually work with research assistants. It's, uh, historical research is a pretty solitary pursuit. I mean, <laughs> historians go into the archives and emerge many months later and then sit and try to make sense of what they've collected. But there are, I know that some of my colleagues do uh, hire undergraduate research assistance to do certain types of literature reviews and even translation work and so on. So there is, even in the humanities, there is scope for under, doing undergraduate research. Um, but I'm also chair of the history department right now, and a lot of our classes are quite small. So faculty uh, really get to know the students well in these classes. I mean, every history major has a small seminar in their sophomore year and then again in the senior year. So this is an opportunity to work very closely in, in an intensive seminar setting with a faculty member. Um, I taught some of these seminars and even our electives. I mean, last spring I taught a, an advanced elective in modern Indian history. I had 14 students. Mm -hmm. So these I got to know these students extremely well. I'm already I've already been approached by one asking if I will write a letter of recommendation for law school. So, and, but I, and I feel like I'm in a very good position to really write a good letter because I know her extreme, extremely well from the semester. And one thing I would have done last spring if the COVID uh, pandemic had not hit, because we live just a mile from campus, but, we we often have our small classes over for dinner at some at the near the end of the semester and i would have had this group even those 14 students maybe not dinner for such a big group but just over in the afternoon for tea and cake or something like that <laughs> so that's and a lot of my colleagues do that with small classes so there's a lot of opportunity for students to get to know faculty especially in some in, in departments that are not overwhelmed by, by major, by undergraduate majors. So what advice uh, do you have for students preparing to enter college? Well, I have two pieces of advice. I mean, <laughs> one is, um, I think it's really important to approach the college process and the applications and all of that with, with the idea that there are lots of really good schools out there and um, not totally fixate on one school and say, ah, oh, this is my dream school. Because there isn't any one dream school that's perfect for any, any app student, any high school student. And that's the kind, so I think be open find the colleges that you're interested in and see where you get in and then make the decision and then do more research. The second thing is that um, 
I wouldn't just look at schools and think, oh, I'm just going to apply based on name and where they rank in various things. And just I just want to go to the top ranked place for the, the most prestigious because that may not be the best fit for a particular student. And I say this with experience, um, you know, our daughter got in somewhere, she wasn't sure that she really wanted to go there. She thought she might want to go to some other schools, but she didn't get into those. But where she went, it turned out to be an amazing place for her. And she got a great education. It, it, she really did well as an undergraduate. It, it, it really brought out the best in her. And I wouldn't have said that in advance, but I think the admissions people saw that, that she was a really good fit for them. So I think there's, you, I think you can trust the process. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And if you don't get into some place that you really had your heart set on, it, there's a, a reason for, there's probably a reason for it. And it may not have been the best fit for you. Dr. Shore, anything else yeah, to add? Yeah, well, Pete sent this question to us in advance. And it's like, <laughs> having had two children who don't went through the process, I, I could stay here all day talking about it. Um, so yes, I mean, to follow up on Presidents' point, neither of our children got into their uh, early, the place they applied early, and they both ended up at the absolute right place for them. So trust the process. Um, also figure out sort of what's most important to you and really try and and uh, uh, focus on, you know, schools that are really uh, going to give you that, uh, you know, because there are many, you know, a couple different dimensions to a college uh, or university. Um, some of the parents in the audience may not like what I'm about to say, but um, I have taught at uh, I've taught at uh, a number of schools. I started out at Williams College, um, and then I was at Harvard and he, here. One of the things, and they were all fantastic. Uh, one of the things about all of them, a little bit, Harvard, it's sort of inching a little bit away from this, but none of them had uh, sororities or fraternities. And I know that, I think in the past they were different. Uh, my advice is uh, that, campus life is probably better without those. Uh, mm. So that's something I would I would give as a piece of advice, not just because I happen to be at a university that doesn't have them, uh, but because uh, just, you know, what I've, I've seen and read and uh, experienced uh, 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 at, at non-Greek schools. That's so helpful, and I think it definitely reaffirms um, what myself and my colleagues talk to students, especially when we do these junior parent programs and, and kickoffs, is to really talk about the perspective and the, you know, the importance of fit and match, and not necessarily to sort of focus so much on the name, um, you know, especially as they're going through this process. So uh, we have a couple of great questions um, that uh, Mary Beth has uh, given uh, in, in the chat. Um, can you remember examples of students who have who have struggled academically uh, in their transition and how you or BC has been able to help them find their way? So I would say, and this is something I've seen uh, even before I got to BC, that the level of preparation that students have in high school really varies uh, among the, the, fr the first year class. There are kids who come in who went to very demanding high schools, the, the freshman year, it can be a, a breeze. And others who come in struggling, um, often because of writing, but not only. That there are also people struggle in the sciences too. And a lot of students come in pre-med or you know, focusing on the sciences. Um, two things, one is there's a lot of support for you as a student. So, um, if you, we have a, a tutoring center, the Connors Family Learning Center, a variety of ways you can get help. Um, faculty also uh, put a lot of time into making sure students succeed. I mean, our success rate at Boston College is extraordinarily high in terms of the fraction of students who graduate. Uh, what I think is most uh, relevant about this, if you are admitted to Boston College, it's because you will be able to do the work. Uh, 
there are many, many more people who apply who can do the work that get in. So, it, yeah. you know, we don't accept people who are unable to do the work. And there is there there may be a catch up period in that first year and especially in the first semester. The freshman writing program is part of bringing everybody up to up to a certain level on writing, which is really key. So those uh, that what I've seen over many years of teaching is that, you know, that catch up happens and, uh, you know, everybody basically gets on top of it, uh, um, even if it, you know, may take one or two semesters. But usually after that, you know, everyone is pretty much thriving. Mm -hmm. And so there are always some, will be some students who are struggling academically, but there are also other students who are struggling psychologically, emotionally. And I mean, I, the thing about BC that I've found over the years is that it's actually a, a really humane place. I mean, it's the administration really looks out for not only students, but also faculty, staff. I mean, it's, I've heard about from colleagues in other universities about all kinds of inhumane treatment that they've received. And I couldn't imagine things like that happening at BC. Mm -hmm. But let me just uh, tell you one story. Um, I had a student, this was, must have been 10 years ago, who plagiarized on a paper. Mm -hmm. And um, I, I called her in to talk to her. And but before she came for my appointment, I called the dean. I think I don't remember if she was at the Lynch School of Education or the yeah. Auto School of Nursing. I think it was the Lynch School of Education. And I called the dean over there and I said, you know, the student has done this. And she was really upset because she said the student has been struggling a lot with psychological problems. So I she said, please bring her over to my office after you're finished talking to her. So I talked to her. I said, you know, you plagiarized. And she said, and she started crying. And she said, oh, I, I've been struggling so much. And I just felt like I had, there was no way I could do the assignment. And and I calmed her down. And then I walked her over to the Lynch School, to the dean's office. And then the dean sat down and spent some time talking to her and to try to figure out some way for her to get the, the kind of help that she needed. So, and I think that's the kind of thing, treatment that you find at Boston College. So one of the things that you talked about earlier in, in terms of, of, of the advice uh, for student is, is that focus on, uh, on fit. And, and so much of when we talk about fit and match, I think a conversation about, about mission and culture sometimes is a really important place to start. So we had a question um, from our, our attendees um, as professors, what do you think is the most beneficial aspect uh, of the Jesuit college experience? Well, a lot of students here are interested in service and kind of engagement. So that, that's one thing. And there's a lot going on at the school that um, supports that and, you know, infrastructure for that and trips and internships, you know, all kinds of things. The Pulse program, which is a fantastic program that places students in organizations uh, to do work. Um, so that's one thing. It's just a huge culture of that kind of uh, activity. Um, when I taught at Harvard, there was, they forbade all academic credit for anything that was kind of in the community and engaged. And BC mm -hmm. has a, a very different attitude to that. It really values engagement uh, of, all, of all kinds. So that's one very important thing. Um, there's also, you know, the Jesuit pedagogy, which of course has changed over time. It's not just one thing, but that uh, element of reflection is really key to a lot of it. And you're going to get that in a lot of the courses, particularly in the core courses, but you'll also get it. We also have capstone courses and, um, you know, other specialized courses that really uh, help people kind of create that fit between what they're learning in the classroom and their lives. And I think if you talk to BC alums, that's one of the things they're going to say that has been so, so important to them. 
Well, I, I'd, I'd like to talk about two things. One is really the, the Jesuits' commitment to education. And, and that goes back to the 16th century when the order was founded. And it's just been the backbone of education for several centuries and all over the world. My father went, uh, studied at a Jesuit college in South India, Loyola College. So, and there, so the commitment of the order to education in a, in a serious way, and also education as a way to um, raise up, let's say, the less fortunate. And this is seen in BC's commitment to uh, need blind, blind admissions, but also in other Jesuit institutions around the world. Um, so that's one, I think, really important dimension of, of the Jesuit education, uh, Je Jesuit institutions. Um, the other is in, in the mission statement that BC seeks to develop men and women for others. And I think that's really at the heart of the Boston College experience. So we got a, a, another question um, uh, from a student. Uh, what type of high school experience makes for a, a strong history student? I don't hear many teachers or professors talking about this outside of STEM, and they thanked us for the session. So. <laughs> <laughs> Could you repeat the question? What kind of, of course. high school? Uh, what type of high school experience makes for a strong history student? Oh, um, well, I always, my colleagues and I always think that college history is really different from high school history. Um, I mean, college history is really focused on in, interpreting the past. So really, using various kinds of sources and so on to try to tell a story about what happened, to explain what happened, to narrate what happened. Whereas we always think that high school history is much more about dates and memorizing facts. And I think this is a little bit overdrawn, but I think that if you're interested in studying history um, in, as an undergraduate, the, the key skill that you can bring from high school is how to write. So really working on your writing and also your reading skills. His, history classes are very reading intensive. So the more reading you do inside and outside class, uh, the better prepared you will be. Because the more you read, the better reader you become. So reading and writing. So basically, the two fundamentals are, are what one should develop in high school for college success in history or the humanities. So lastly, for me, um, you know, obviously we're, um, we're in a, a very different um, environment, um, you know, with the pandemic. Um, are there things that, that you've observed so far in, in the fall semester and any, any reflections in terms of, of, of how your courses are going so far, how the students seem to be doing? So we're teaching our uh, Planet in Peril course on fully online, mm -hmm. um, you know, and given what we already told you about it, uh, you know, in some ways that's less of an adjustment than other people because we already had our lectures online. And mm -hmm. um, we've been, uh, I would have to say, kind of really um, pleasantly surprised, maybe too strong, although maybe. Uh, at just how exciting and positive the experience has been so far. I mean, it's just been three weeks, but the class is really engaged. We're doing a lot of breakout small group work. Um, we feel like we're really getting to know the students. Um, there's just a level of energy, even on Zoom, that I wouldn't have predicted. <laughs> Yeah. So, and we're hearing really great things back from the students, like how much they're liking the class and so forth. So, so far it's, it's been really good. Um, and that sort of, you know, the kinks about, we were worried about certain things like someone taking an in-person class and then having to find a, a place to go, a quiet place uh, to take our class and having only 10 minutes in between and so forth. Everything's worked out really well. The, the, uh, campus is equipped for that. It's really equipped for that hybrid model of some online, some in person. Um, so uh, 
it's been great. We're, we're really having a ball. Yeah, so to that point, so I, I'm in the office on, on Mondays and Fridays, and, and actually our um, information, our, our uh, admission lobby, if you will, has been turned over to the university in terms of part of oh. those remote um, learning opportunities where if a student has an 11 a.m. remote, they have a 12 o'clock in person, maybe even right across the hall uh, in the auditorium. So to your point, yeah. that's been a great resource. Yeah, I mean, I didn't know what to expect at all. I mean, last spring, as as I mentioned earlier, I, I was teaching one class with 14 students. So when we had to go remote, it was pretty easy. I knew all the students and it, with 14 students, it's pretty easy to have a discussion on Zoom. My classes are very discuss discussion intensive. Um, I don't know what to expect with 80 students, mm -hmm. but they seem really excited and energized and engaged. And I, um, we also encouraged students to come just to drop in in our office hours. So we have weekly office hours on Zoom. So students are starting to do that and just chatting. So I'm starting to get to know some of the students, which is really nice because that's one of the great rewards of, of teaching is to get to know new people every year and continue to maintain uh, friendships with students that have been formed in previous years. So the students are really adapting to the, the circumstances un, unbelievably well. So it's very heartening to see. Well, it, it, to that point too, and I think I mentioned this before we actually got started that, you know, our work has, has certainly shifted. You know, usually um, um, myself and my colleagues would be, you know, packing up our suitcases and headed um, uh, to high schools and college fairs uh, around the globe. So, so we've had to shift I as well. Um, but what's interesting is that we never would have been actually having this opportunity with the two of you and your colleagues to sort of connect with prospective students. You know, usually we're doing this at, at the admitted student stage. So um, it's just been a, a delight to be able to sort of kind of launch this, this, this virtual open house, which we've never done before. Um, but to really sort of connect with prospective students and parents, you know, to take a deep dive like this, which is wonderful. Before we wrap up, are, um, are there anything else that the two of you want to uh, talk to our audience about or impart to our audience before we uh, wrap up this morning? I'd just like to say one thing. I mean, uh, Julie said that we've gone, we went through this process twice with our kids. Um, it'll all work out. So just kind of take a deep breath and relax. Don't be too, don't be stressed about it. There are a lot of really good schools out there. Your son or daughter will get into a, an excellent place. And then it's up to them to take advantage of that, the opportunities that they will be given. Yeah, and you know, feel free to reach out to us. Send us an email if you have questions. Um, we don't often hear from prospective students, but uh, you know, we're always happy to engage with you. So please don't be a stranger. Great. Well, I wanna thank you both so much uh, for joining us this morning. Uh, it's been wonderful to sort of hear um, your reflections uh, on your students and your, and your stories and your experiences. And, and thank you so much for helping us kick off these, these five Saturdays uh, with, with, uh, in style. Um, wanna thank Mary Beth uh, <laughs> behind the scenes for managing the Q and A. Um, wanna thank our participants for being here this morning and for putting their questions into the chat. Um, as I said, we, we uh, we look forward to continuing to connect with you um, throughout this month and throughout the process. Um, anything that we can do to help, uh, especially sort of navigating not only the Boston College admissions process, but the admissions process in general. Uh, there's so many changes that are happening in light of the pandemic. So wish you well, stay safe. Thanks to our participants. Uh, enjoy this beautiful weekend and uh, we'll talk to you soon. Thanks everyone.